today, jumping off a psalm's praise into the real valley below, then finding our way back to the top in a box. Coffee with Creamer, where you get to sit down with our host, Dr. Barry Creamer, for a conversation about faith, life, and culture. We'll look at old ideas through a new lens, turn those culture wars on their head, and paint a picture of the way things could be. If you like your thinking deep and your coffee hot, pull up a chair. You're in the right place. We are doing a scripture today. We are going to peruse our way through Psalm 34. Uh, it's a little longer than some of the other psalms, not, not the longest, though. It's around 22 verses, and in fact, it is an acrostic. Uh, and interestingly, it's an acrostic through all but the last verse, <laughs> and which is not in order. It uh, is out of the acrostic entirely, and so there's an importance to that closing verse, obviously that we will want to focus on. And you'll recognize some of the verses in this psalm. Uh, And it's one of those psalms that begins uh, in a way that seems clear. It's just a praise. We're going to do all this praising and happiness. And then uh, takes us in a completely different direction. And it almost makes you wonder, what's going on? Are these intended to be separate psalms or something? And obviously what we arrive at at the end is a better understanding of why we're able to praise the way the opening of the psalm talks about. And this one is particularly important because a part of what comes up at the end, what I was talking about in the introduction as being in a box, uh, which will hopefully make sense by the time we get there. Uh, so the, the interesting thing about this psalm, you know, in the first three verses, you have all these statements about praise, but in reality, in the, in the way the Hebrew text is given to us, those are, those are the first four verses because the first verse is the superscript of the psalm, uh, the little caption underneath the psalm number that you'll see in your translation or most of your translations, where it says, a psalm of David, but in this case, it gives a specific context in his history, a psalm of David when he pretended madness before Abimelech who drove him away, and he departed. Now, we all remember this story. If you don't, I'll read it to you in just a moment. It's just a few verses, and it's always such a quirky little story about David feigning madness, and and you think it just relates to the idea of Jacob and deception or how tricky they can be and things like that, but it doesn't even work very well. I mean, he's only there for a short time, but there's more to it than that. There's a lot more to it going on than that, and in the immediate context of that event, there are a couple of other events that take place that are so important, and I mean the immediate context. Why is he hiding out at Achish, uh, the king of with Achish, the king of Gath? Why is and this is he's he's referred to as Abimelech, as if my father is the king, you know, kind of name. But it's at Gath. Uh, so why is David feigning madness there? And everyone knows the story. I mean, it all runs together. So we need to have that context in mind as we come to it. And then it changes the nature of what we're hearing, even in the first three verses, as a praise. To start a psalm that says, I'll bless the Lord at all times, with the description that he's giving us this psalm in the context when he feigned madness before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. But the and he departed part brings us to understand where this psalm is actually written or where he actually provides for us the context of it. And so it's going to start with David fleeing Saul. And you'll remember the famous episode when he meets with Jonathan in the field. Jonathan has told him he can return, and David says, I can't. Your dad's trying to kill me, and Jonathan says, that's not true, and he goes back, 
and they come to this agreement, well, I'll find out, Jonathan says to David, and then we'll meet in a field, and I'll shoot a, an arrow, and if it goes too far, you know, you'll realize that he actually is trying to kill you, and then we'll get together after that, and, and you'll go your way, and I'll go my way, and so on. And that's what transpires. Jonathan meets David out in the field, shoots the arrow. The messenger goes to get the arrow, and it's an indication that Saul really is trying to kill David, and so David's going to have to be a fugitive, and they hug and go their separate ways. It's in that context that David goes down to Nob to meet with the priest at Nob and get some help because he just needs food. He he needs to survive, and, so, and he doesn't have anything with him because he's fleeing in such haste from Saul. And so he lies to the priest at Nob and says, well, I'm on a mission for Saul, and uh, the priest gives him a sword and bread. He gives him Goliath's sword, remember, and bread from the holy place. And then when David goes from there, he goes to Achish, the king of Gath, who's referred to as Abimelech in this psalm, which is a common name. It's a title, you know, my father's king, sort of a lineage king kind of name, apparently. So anyway, David rose and fled that day. This is in 1 Samuel 21 as context and uh, went to Achish, the king of Gath. And what happens there is that the people who are in Gath point out to the king, you can't let David come here. He's the, he's the guy who's the hero of Israel. I mean, he killed Goliath. And this is at Gath. So he killed Goliath, and he's the great conqueror who they sing these songs about. Saul has slain his thousand, and David is ten thousands. And so you can't do that. David finds out this is what's going on. And in fear of what will happen if he goes to Gath as the great conquering hero of Israel, he changes his behavior before them in verse 13 of 1 Samuel 21 and pretends to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spit run down on his beard. So he's committed to selling the act of insanity, right? So then Achish said to his servants, don't I have enough mad people here? Why are you bringing me another one? Uh, this, this is his response. But then, and when he says, shall this fellow come into my house? You know, you get, this is the, and he drove him away and he departed, uh, part of the part of the story. But, but another part of that story involves Gad actually coming to David and saying, you can't hide out here. You will not be safe here. You need to go down into the wilderness. And he goes down and hides in the cave of Adullam. Now, backstory here that we don't think about that's happening at the same moment is Saul finds out that David has gone to Nob, the priest at Nob, and he kills through, I mean, he tells his servants to kill him, and you remember, nobody will do it, but Doeg the Edomite, who is at the core of this story and the story that's behind Psalm 52, two different psalms about this one guy and his actions, Doeg the Edomite says, oh, I'll do it, and he kills him. He's not, he's not Jewish, and he kills not just Ahimelech, the priest. He kills all the priest's family and all the people who are at Nob. It is a slaughter of the entire priestly village, except for one son of Ahimelech, Abiathar, who escapes to David at the cave at Adullam just after he has fled from Gath and Achish, the king at Gath. So in this context, and David, by the way, admits fault to Abiathar, who becomes his cohort in a lot of the episodes that are to follow in the story of David's life. David says to Abiathar, it's my fault that your father's dead. And it is. David lied about what he was doing when he went to his father. He says, it's my fault, but if you'll stay with me, I will take care of you. You don't have a family, but now you do have a family. You're in my family. I will care for you. And it's in, the, in that context that David writes this psalm about, and, and look at how it begins. In, in the first three verses, it begins with blessing the Lord at all times. Not in, a, not in a pristine context where David sits in his throne room and everything is in order, but fleeing Saul, fleeing this feigned madness, fleeing the butchery of Doeg the Edomite down into the cave of Adullam where he's still a, fug a fugitive. He says in verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. In the second verse, my soul shall make its boast in the Lord. 
The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Those first three verses, just giving this exhortation to praise, uh, are often received out of their context and simply as a statement that we have an admonition, a command to praise, to show up and praise God. And honestly, I, I think of it very often in the way Mark Twain describes it, uh, in Letters from the Earth. And I, I've mentioned this uh, when we were on the radio for a long time. I, I mentioned this, that he wrote that book, and, and it wasn't even published, I don't think, until uh, 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 posthumously uh, after he was dead, and, and partially because it was so radically skeptical. But Mark Twain was radically skeptical. I mean, he was against everything and everybody, and the bitterness of his life came through in all of his works. Of course, it comes through with profound humor. I mean, the guy is hilarious. I admit that. Even in the terrible works like Letters from the Earth, it's, it's, it's funny. But it is funny so that we read it and he's able to jab way down into our hearts with the bitterness that he senses. And part of what he does in that book, the letter, Letters from the Earth, he describes, you know, Satan watching the earth and writing letters back to his angel buddies about what's going on in the fallen world. And as he describes what's happening in the earth, one of the things Satan says, and I don't have the quotation in front of me, I'll just describe it to you, but one of the things uh, Satan says, Lucifer says, as he sends back these letters to his angel friends is, I'll never understand these human beings. I mean, they go to church on Sunday morning for a half hour or an hour, and they, they sing songs as if they desire to do forever what they can barely stand to do for the one hour they do it on every Sunday. Uh, that's how most of us think about praise, uh, that we are going to be forced to, to sit in the church choir in heaven for eternity and utter these dull praises to God, which we might enjoy for a few minutes, but I mean, eventually it's like, come on, there's a football game or something. I got to get out of here. I mean, El Chico is waiting. Somebody's I got to get, I got to, that attitude that we have toward praise, that it's a compulsion misses the entire point of praise. So, so and and I and it's it's hard to get people to turn back around the corner and see what praise actually is. So let me try it this way. I remember reading a few years back uh, about a study that uh, this researcher, a psychologist did at the at San Francisco State University back in 2012. His name is David Matsumoto, if you want to go look up the study and see what came of it after that. Uh, but he did this study, uh, and what it, what, what it was was observing things that are cross-cultural, that seem to be built into human nature and the human psyche. And uh, one of those things was this sign of triumph that we give when we've won. Uh, so, you know, when a person crosses the finish line, that their arms jut into the air, you know, in this great victory, and your your fists are clenched, and and you're saying, look, I, I've won, I've won, and, and your face, and I, I, honestly, a lot of faces are sort of hideous in that moment. Uh, they create not a, not a smile, it's not a, oh, I finally won, but more of a grimace that comes out of it as you read the descriptions, and as you just see people do it, but you can, you know, you just do it automatically. That a gesture, that action that happens when people cross the finish line, when they experience triumph of any kind, you know, whatever it is, winning a game or whatever it is that happens, appears not to be culturally inculcated. That's how we think of it. Oh, our cultures teach us to do it. It appears to be just built into the human psyche that you can't help it. And I remember watching a Special Olympics event. Uh, I had a, a coattail relative who was in Special Olympics events for a while. And, uh, and I mean, I, I watched the Special Olympics event, and this person who could not see, so was blind, could not hear, was deaf, and could not communicate with speech, was participating in the event by having helpers run with her, but participating in something like a 100-yard dash. I think it was a 50-yard dash. And so they got down the, down the lane and crossed the finish line, and, you know, the whole crowd was cheering and everything. And this person who couldn't see or hear and couldn't speak, so has very little direct connection with the world in the way we think of it, right? As soon as she crossed the line, jutted her arms up into the air with her fists clenched and her face scrunched up saying, I won, I won. And it was that, 
in looking at that after having read that study made me go, wow, it is built into human nature to want to experience that triumph. That's what praise is. It's not a command that we have to properly honor a selfish God who wants someone to appreciate how great he is. It's not that at all. It's us finally crossing a line and saying, oh, it's true, there he is, praise God. And our hands go up automatically and our response is what we were created to have in his presence. And it will be that natural a reaction that we have with him. That's where we want to be. I'm not saying that's where you ought to decide you ought to be. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what David is saying. Praise and thanks is where we want to be. We want to be crossing the line where the triumph takes place. Okay, so that, that's where we, that, those first three verses are where David wants us to be because that's where we want to be. But how do we get there? It doesn't begin with us deciding we're going to praise God. And think about David composing this psalm with Abiathar, whose entire family has been slaughtered before him, responding to the words that David is saying. And so we don't begin with praise. Instead, we begin with need. That's how David begins. In verse 4, after these statements about praise, he says, in verse 4 of Psalm 34, I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. This is David who's been fleeing Saul and hiding at Achish and now hiding in a cave, not in a hotel, not where things are provided for him, in a cave in the wilderness. And he's saying it to Abiathar who's seen his family slaughtered, and he delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man, cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord, and we'll come back to that poor man crying out, and the Lord heard him. The Lord took care of his need. In verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around all those who fear him, and he delivers them. I mean, in, in one sense, this is him saying, look, the angel of the Lord is the one who's taking care of me, I received bread and a sword from the house of the Lord, from the priest's house, when I was fleeing from Saul. And, and when I was at Achish, it was Gad the prophet who came to me and told me that I needed to leave there and come to this cave where I'm being provided for. Oh, taste and see, he says, that the Lord is good. And this is more than just you know, so when David feigns madness before Abimelech, as the superscript says, before Achish at Gath, when he feigns that madness, this becomes uh, an image of the story that takes place again in, in Luke 16, you know, when the beggar is laid at the rich man's gate and he's pleading for the bread that would come from that rich man, and the rich man shuts the gate and refuses to receive him into his house. This is, And that's how this superscript actually goes, and Achish refused to receive him and sent him away. So we see the contrast between the poor man who could not find his sustenance in the place where he was begging for it, but the Lord heard his cry, and the Lord gave him bread, and the Lord took care of him and sent him to a safe cave, and so on. It's that contrast that's going on so that his need became his faith because he was calling out for help, and lo and behold, the Lord helped. So faith begins with need, and then eventually that faith is going to take us back around to where we can get to praise, but not directly. We'll get there in a moment. So as he goes on in verse 8, he says, so taste and see that it's the Lord who is good. Blessed is the man who trusts or takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints. There's no want to those who fear him. And, and spoken from a cave in the wilderness, he says, the young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. So he's taken care of in a way that gives comfort then he's offering to Abiathar, who himself is fleeing the wrath of those who have slaughtered his family and left him without refuge, except when he came to David, 
who now, in the same way David turned to the Lord and found help, is saying, Abiathar, you can turn to me and find help. David, our messianic figure, right? That's what's happening. And by the way, God giving them bread in the wilderness is, you know, God providing bread for the Israelites in the wilderness outside of Egypt when they had left there, and Jesus providing bread for the disciples, for the, for the multitudes that followed him outside of Bethsaida when he was there in the wilderness, and they were hungry and waiting for him to provide for them, and he does. This is what the Lord does. So the first step in this psalm is, is, is simply making this point that faith begins with need. The second point begins in the 11th verse of the psalm where he says, come, you children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Now, he's already had his need turn into faith. So faith begins with need, but now we're going to see hope come out of that faith, where he believes that things are going to be okay because he has faith in the true God. So hope begins with faith in this section, starting in verse 11. Come, you children, listen to me, and I'll teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is a man in verse 12, who deserves life and loves many days that he may see good. Keep your tongue, this is the man, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. He certainly has Doeg, the Edomite, in mind. Doeg is the one who took the rumor back to Saul to say, well, I I know the priest, I know the priest gave David bread while he was fleeing from you, so I think the priests are conspiring against you. And David has no love for Doeg the Edomite. He deserves judgment for what he's done for conspiring against the priests of God and against David. And he, the fact that he's an Edomite plays a role in this in just a moment because of how this carries forward for us. So we'll talk about that in a second. So in verse 13, he goes on to say, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. In verse 14, depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Think of him saying this to Abiathar, whose family's been murdered by Doeg the Edomite. And Doeg seems to have all the power with him. Saul and the kingdom is at his disposal. And and, and Abiathar's family is dead And David is saying to him, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off their remembrance from the earth. The righteous, in contrast, in verse 17, he says, cry out, and the Lord hears. And he delivers them out of all of their trouble. This is the point in verse 18 of the second section. The Lord is near to those who are of a broken heart. And he saves such as have a contrite spirit. This is not simply, you know, as we're familiar with the 51st Psalm, uh, contrition or humility that we've adopted, a pose of humility, even sincere, but a pose of humility before God to say, we humble ourselves before you to ask for help. This is not that. This is a soul crushed by the events of life. This is not humility. This is humiliation. Abiathar's family has been slaughtered. David has been chased into the wilderness. And yet he says, it is to those who have been humiliated, who have been crushed, that God is looking so that he can help, that God is listening so that he can respond to your cries. In in this context, It's being written with Doeg the Edomite, a Gentile, a Canaanite. He's not Canaanite, but Achish was Canaanite, remember, and ran off David. And so in the context of saying the natives of this land, the people who are from here, the people who opposed us settling in the land, those enemies of ours, they're the ones who are doing the evil, but God knows, and he favors his people. And so Ultimately and eventually, the Canaanites are completely wiped out. I know the Edomites are a different people, but it's not just Doeg. Remember, the superscript is about Achish, Abimelech, the king in Gath. And all those people end up being wiped out. The extent of God's willingness to hear the crushed goes beyond him simply saying, I love my people, my specific people, Israel, 
but everybody else I don't. And so when Israel is suffering, I still identify with them because they're my people. It's more than that. This is him saying, anyone who's crushed, I'm willing to help. And that comes into the New Testament in in a strange passage, in a passage about a woman who begs Jesus for help. And she is, uh, this this epithet is used about her, this, this, this term of derision, a derogatory term, is used about her to identify her in Matthew's telling of the story when this woman comes to beg Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter. She's referred to as a Canaanite woman. We know it's an epithet because there are no Canaanites. I mean, they were wiped out. They were slaughtered. So they're gone for hundreds of years. And yet she's called a Canaanite. In another gospel, she's referred to as the Syrophoenician woman. So so we know literally she comes from the place of the seafarers, you know, the, the place where the Phoenicians are. That's where she's actually from. But here she's referred to in the Matthews account as a Canaanite so that we're drawn back to these people who were wiped out because they were so evil. And yet this woman comes and she begs Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter have mercy on me, is all she cries, because she's lost so much. O son of David, my daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. This is in Matthew 15. I'm reading in verse 23 now. But he didn't answer her a word. He, he plays into this response with her that will teach his disciples and us this new understanding of just how responsive God is to the cries of the crushed, those who have been, who've been humiliated. And so she goes further into her humiliation as she begs for help from someone who appears to be saying, no, 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 this is only for Israel. We can't do this for you. So she says, have mercy on me, begging for help. O Lord, son of David, my daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he didn't answer her at all. And his disciples come and beg him and say, send this woman away. She's crying after us. And he answered, I, well, I was only sent to the house of Israel, right? That's what you guys believe. So she came and knelt before him and said, Lord, help me. And he said, well, it wouldn't be right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs, would it? And she said, yes, Lord, that's true. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered her, oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This woman who is crushed and humiliated and a Canaanite in the name that's given to her in Matthew asks for help as if to say, a descendant of Doeg, a descendant of Achish, the people who had rejected the one begging for crumbs at the gate at Achish, the one who had received the bread from the priest who was then slaughtered by the Edomite, the ones who were doing all of that evil when they are the ones being crushed and turn around and ask for mercy just have mercy on us. My daughter is oppressed by a demon. God's eye is on them. And he says, I'll help. I will. I'll meet your need. And he does. We're given that story so that we realize that hope, the hope, you know, the thing that a desperate person has looking to the future with this belief that things could be better actually comes from faith from us turning to God and crying out for help because we had a need. So, you know, faith begins in need, hope begins in faith. But the last part of this psalm, the last four verses, three are what we'll take first, are the ones that really get us there. So first, starting in verse 19, and this is that hope in God will finally bring us back to praise. But I said in a box when we were doing the introduction, there's a reason I said that. You'll, you'll see it here. Many, he says in verse 19, are the afflictions of the righteous. He knows this is not naive praise. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, yet the Lord delivers him out of them all. He's saying that to Abiathar whose family is already dead. He delivers us out of them all? Well, I escaped, but all my family is dead, and that makes it okay? Verse 20, this is even stranger. 
He guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. And then he says, evil shall slay the wicked. And those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. And then I'll read the last verse to you in a moment, the one that's not a part of this acrostic, this alphabet of this poem. And so in in, in verse 20, the famous verse, he guards all of his bones, not one of them is broken. That's carried forward into the New Testament. You recognize it, right? In John 19, when it describes the crucifixion, I won't read the whole passage to you, It says that the soldiers are going to go to the cross and break the legs of the people who are being crucified because the next day is a holy day and they need the the victims off the cross. And so they're going to break their legs so that they can't breathe and then they'll die. They can't push up, they, they die. But when they come to Jesus, they see that he's already dead. And I'm reading now in John 19, verse 33, and so they didn't break his legs. But instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once there came out blood and water. And he who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth, John's insertion there, so that you can also believe. He's, John is saying, I saw it with my own eyes. He was dead. They didn't even bother to break his legs. He was so dead. And they pierced his side into his heart with a, with a spear so that they would know that he was dead. He was dead. And then he says in verse 36, for these things took place so that the scripture might be fulfilled. And then he quotes the psalm, not one of his bones will be broken. And then again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. When John quotes that verse, it it seems so obvious reading it in Psalm 34 or reading it in this passage that he would be saying, but it's going to be okay. God is going to protect him. Not one of his bones is going to be broken. He won't let a hair of his head fall right? That's the idea. Well, of course, that's not the idea. The only reason they don't break his bones is because he's dead. John's not unaware of this. And yet in the, in the, uh, not, and yet, because in the immediate context, the very next verses invite the discussion of his burial and then immediately subsequently his resurrection. That's what follows immediately. And, it's, and it's, it's an easy and obvious reference in a culture where ossuaries are the standard for burial. That is, you take the body down from the cross and you put it in the garden tomb and you lay it on a ledge and you seal up the tomb for a year or so. And in that dry and desert land, you wait until there's nothing but bones. The body is desiccated, the bones remain. And then you gather up the dry bones and you put them in a box and you store the box in that tomb that belongs to the family until the next person dies and is laid on the ledge, and then you put their bones in a box. And in these boxes are the bones of the dead. The bones of the dead are the things that are not broken. And it's because those bones point. And and think about it. In Ezekiel 37, why do we have the reference to the dry bones and Shall these bones live again? You know, Lord. And then the response from the Lord. And, and, I, and Ezekiel's own vision, if I said Isaiah, I mean Ezekiel, his vision, looking at the bones and saying, well, I saw a wind blow over them, the spirit blowing over them, and, and they gather together in the sinews and then the moisture, and then they stand up and then they're breathing, and then there's a living army. And the Lord says, I, these dry bones will live, and then you'll know that I am the Lord. His promise of the covenant is wrapped up in this idea of a resurrection. I know how Ezekiel 37 presents it and how we understand that as the nations will give up the bodies of the Jews who are there and the Israelites will come home to their land and they'll be resurrected in their occupation of their own homeland. I know the imagery, the analogy, but the way that's carried into the New Testament for us is that literally the dry bones will become alive again. And saying the bones are not broken is not, it's not even literally a reference to the bones not being broken. He can bring bones back together just like he can bring everything else back together. The point is that in a land where bones are the residue of the dead, he's saying, I will protect even the dead. There will be a resurrection. And in John 19, it's explicit. It's hard to miss the the, the thing that we're supposed to infer 
even when we're reading it in Psalm 34, in a land where a box of bones represents the future. And this is the idea by the time we get to verse 22 when he says not just the Lord blesses his servants, but the Lord redeems the soul of his servants. And none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. David, who had been humiliated in his fugitive status and in Gath being rejected and then living in a cave in Adullam and now being approached by the sole survivor of a family of priests who were slaughtered because of his own deception. David writes this psalm to say, and yet the Lord will be faithful, faithful to his people so that we will have praises rising not because everything goes well for us, not because we simply overcome a little bit the terrible things that do happen, but because one day, because our hope is in God, because our faith was in God, because our need was so great, we had nowhere else to turn. Because one day, we cross the line and realize that our hope in God never makes us ashamed, as Paul says it in Romans 5. And when we cross that line, then we raise our hands and can't help but praise God as we say, yes, it's true, God is faithful and our hope was justified. My, may our faith convince us that God knows as well as we do that something's wrong with this world and our hope assure us that he will make it right, not because we think our life has always been blessed or always been okay, but precisely because we know it has not been. That is, may our need strengthen our faith and our faith, our hope. Thanks for joining us for Coffee with Creamer. Your cup of coffee may be finished, but we are not. Come back next week for a refill as we sit down to examine a new set of ideas and cultural issues. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or visit our website at barrycreamer.com. Until next time, keep your mug hot and your mind sharp.